We'll talk about uh, main memory management today, a lot of memory scheduling, some of this you have seen before. But I have some new review assignments for you. Of course, this didn't display correctly. Let's try again. There you go. <laughs> you may have read some of this before, either in 447 or 740. So if you have, it'll be easy for you. We'll talk about some memory scheduling. We'll cover these papers also, hopefully today. And these are some other papers on uh, main memory management. And Han will upload this, actually. Yeah, he will upload this paper. OK. <laughs> you were waiting for new reviews, right? <laughs> we haven't had them for a while. And remember the old review. How many of you have done it? This is still like architecture. OK, good. At least half of the class. What did you think of it? That was pretty cool. Pretty interesting. Was it easy to read? Yeah? OK. No complaints, I guess. OK, this is a reminder. Uh, we've covered these slides, so I'm not going to go over them. But uh, basically, there are two deadlines. One is, actually, this is this Sunday. Uh, you're supposed to send me your list of papers that you're going to do your literature survey on, uh, and three papers. And feel free to send additional papers also. And uh, we're going to schedule the presentations in front of class. And that's still tentative. And this is, again, you can go through these. I just copied and pasted them. Yes? Uh, is the paper, like the actual written part of that, due at the same time as the speech or the talk? Yeah, I guess I have not specified. Have I specified a date on that? No. Turn in your write up. There you go. December 1st. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. But that could get shifted also, shifted forward, not backwards. Okay. Okay, last lecture we had covered uh, data flow. We finished data flow and systolic arrays as well. So hopefully you remember those concepts. These are different execution models, which are quite interesting. Today we'll begin shared resource management. Although you have seen some of shared cache management when we covered caches, right? Remember Vivek's lecture? Uh, he talked about shared cache management. We may go back to it. I'll briefly cover it today, but I'm not going to go into detailed mechanisms. Uh, I will mainly focus on main memory as a shared resource and how can we actually uh, control that sharing in main memory. These are some other readings that <laughs> for you. <laughs> this is for you to take a look. I, I'm going to cover a bunch of these actually today and uh, next time. Okay, let's talk about resource sharing. Remember there were three uh, resource sharing leads to resource contention also. There were three fundamental uh, things that degrade performance in the parallel portion of a workload. What were those? I think I asked this question once, once more before. You can guess where, where else it may come. Anybody remember? There's the MDOS, uh, MDOS law, serial versus parallel portion. Serial portion is where one thread exists. Parallel portion, you have many threads potentially, but parallel portion is not perfectly parallel due to three fundamental reasons. Anybody? You're working on this. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, resource contention is one of them. That's an easy one. And maybe synchronization? That's right, synchronization slash communication, which is the same thing. One more. That's a synchronization, right? That's an example of a synchronization. Load imbalance, there you go. Three. Is and a, isn't yeah. load imbalance same as synchronization? Because you're still, mm -hmm. if the faster thread finishes first and waiting for others. So that depends. That depends if you're actually synchronizing, right? You may, be, you may have lots of tasks, but you may not be synchronizing. And your task may be bigger and smaller. And you still have a load imbalance, right? Okay. Even if you're not synchronizing. Okay, and if you find a fourth one, <laughs> I'll give you chocolate or something. 
<laughs> okay, so resource sharing, uh, the idea is simple, right? Instead of dedicating a hardware resource, at least in the, within the context of hardware, it, in, instead of dedicating a hardware resource for a hardware context, allow multiple contexts to use it. And there, there could be many resources, functional units can be shared across hardware contexts in a multi-threaded engine. Pipeline can be shared, caches, buses, memory. Why do you want this? Well, it improves uh, utilization and efficiency, right? This leads to hopefully higher throughput given a same, uh, the same amount of resource. And we've seen this in uh, simultaneous multi-threading, for example, or multi-threading in general. When one thread is idle, the other thread can use that resource. Uh, or looking at it from the resource point of view, when a resource is left, left idle by a thread, another thread can use it. No need to replicate the resource, right? Uh, okay. It also reduces communication latency, right? If you actually share a resource, you can keep the shared data in that shared resource. That way you don't need to communicate across these resources that are potentially partitioned or distributed. And we've seen that also. And this is also compatible with the shared memory model, right? It, it just works nicely. But the disadvantage is it results in contention for shared resources, right? Uh, when the resource is not idle, another thread now cannot use it, even though it may need it. Uh, and similarly, this is, uh, this is in terms of time. If you look at it from a space point of view, if the resource is a space resource, like a cache, uh, if the space is occupied by one thread, another thread uh, needs to reoccupy it, which means that it's going to evict, uh, evict the data that was brought in by the previous thread. Okay, so what are, what are the implications of this? This sometimes reduces each or some thread's performance or all thread's performance. Uh, and thread performance can be worse than when it's run alone. And we've seen this uh, in caches. Uh, it eliminates performance isolation, right? You get some sort of isolation when you actually uh, replicate the resources because it's dedicated for this particular hardware context and it's going to get at least that performance. Once you start sharing, it's not clear. Uh, you, you'll get inconsistent performance across runs because the performance depends on whether or not the other thread that you're co-located with, that you're sharing the resource with, is actually using that resource. So you're not isolated anymore. And this uncontrolled sharing, if you do not control the sharing, you can degrade quality of service. And we had seen this in switch on event multi-threading, for example, right? If you, uh, the performance of a thread really depends on when you schedule it uh, and when you deschedule it. Okay, we're gonna see these in more detail. Okay, just a high level very quickly. Why is unpredictable performance or lack of quality of service bad? In this case, you, you don't get good quality of service, right? Unless you somehow control it. Why is this bad? Because one of the main reasons it makes programmers life difficult, right? You can optimize your program really nicely, even in a multi-threaded program, but you can get low performance because for some reason the resources that you thought uh, were available for this program are not available at runtime because some other thread is using it or some other program is using it that you have no control over. So this is terrible, right? If you're doing a high performance programming and for some reason your program is executing on a uh, system with shared resources with some other random program, all of your performance optimizations may <laughs> be useless. So that's the programmer's point of view. Uh, from the user point of view, this causes discomfort to the user, and we will uh, see that also. An important program can starve, right? Uh, and in fact, um, a lot of the issues that you uh, may see or may not see in your Windows 8, <laughs> it used to be there in Windows, <laughs> some version, uh, come from shared software resource also. They're, they're shared software resource in the operating system, and when one thread is accessing that resource, another thread cannot access it. If you do not manage it well, for example, the IO subsystem, if you do not allow another thread to access the IO subsystem where, when one thread is accessing it, then you may actually get <laughs> very bad discomfort. 
And that does happen. I don't know. You might, it might have happened to you guys, right? It does happen to me all the time with the PowerPoint here. <laughs> Just goes into this loop waiting for some I.O. and it never comes back. It seems like some other uh, application uh, is accessing the I.O. resource and somehow it's not, uh, PowerPoint is not able to access it. It's not waking up. Partly because of a software bug probably, but. <laughs> But I, I guess that's, that's a case in point. When you have shared software resources, you can actually have more, more easily have software bugs too. Okay, and finally, it makes system management difficult also. If you cannot control the performance of a threat, if you cannot predict, uh, provide predictable performance in hardware, uh, you cannot enforce a service level, level agreement. And we will, uh, you have seen this earlier, but we will see this more concretely. Uh, so there's a trade-off between sharing and partitioning, right? Sharing improves throughput because it gives you better utilization uh, of space or uh, time. Partitioning provides performance isolation. Right? You get predictable performance. At least you get the performance that was provided by the resource that is allocated to you uh, because you have a dedicated space or dedicated bandwidth. Uh, an important question is, can we get the benefits of both? So I'd like you to think about this as we discuss things. Uh, one idea to achieve this is perhaps we can design shared resource in a controllable, partitionable way. Right? The resource is shared, but at any time we allocate it such that uh, you get some performance isolation. And we'll try to approximate this as we go along. What are these shared hardware resources? There are many, right? Uh, in a memory subsystem is shared in both multi-threaded processors and uh, chip multiprocessors, multi-core processors. All non-private caches, interconnects, memory controllers, buses, banks. Uh, the I.O. subsystem is shared, again, among all the hardware contexts. Uh, I.O., DMA controllers, Ethernet controllers, anything you have in hardware. Some other accelerators may be shared across different threads, right? Uh, in fact, uh, one, one of the processors that we discussed, Sun Niagara, had a floating point unit shared across, how many threads was it, 32 threads? 32 hardware contexts, I think, because they had uh, eight cores, each had four hardware contexts. So yes, you have a single floating point unit shared by 32 threads. And later they figured out that this is a performance bottleneck, so Niagara 2 had a floating point unit for each core. They reduce the sharing. Mm. The processor is shared. Well, I guess that's part of the processor, unless you consider a floating point unit an accelerator. For some reason, I start thinking floating point unit as an accelerator. It used to be, right? <laughs> a while ago. Some of you may remember the x87. <laughs> OK. The processor is shared. Uh, this is the tightest resource sharing, perhaps, uh, in uh, in a multi-thread engine, pipeline resource and L1 caches are shared between different hardware contexts. There are a lot of issues related to resource sharing. This is just a, a brain dump of the issues. System performance gets affected by resource sharing. Fairness per application performance gets affected. And uh, this sharing affects some other metrics, right? Power, energy, system cost. May, uh, the reason resource sharing happens is because you would like to minimize the cost also, not only improve efficiency, but uh, you, you want to minimize the cost because one way, one way is dedicating a cache for every thread context. Either uh, you increase the cache space to be able to do that, which increases cost, or you keep the same cache but divide it into very small chunks, which uh, tanks the performance for the thread that you allocate that much uh, cache for, right? So system cost is a big concern. Uh, resource sharing. Uh, affects lifetime also, and I'll let you think about that. Reliability, perhaps, effects of faults. If you share the resources, uh, a fault in that resource affects every thread that's sharing it, right? Whereas if you isolate or partition the resources, you contain some of the faults more easily. It doesn't affect every uh, thread. There are security implications as well. Uh, people have shown that if you share the caches, between two threads, and one of them is a, um, 
thread that manipulates private keys, uh, another malicious program potentially can observe uh, induced cache misses on that other thread that manipulates uh, private keys and statistically figure out what the key is. People have shown these attacks. Uh, of course, you need to uh, orchestrate that attack very well for it to work. Uh, so these are real issues that are related to resource sharing or caused by resource sharing or need to be considered when you're sharing a resource. Mm. On the other hand, uh, partitioning uh, gives you isolation. And okay, I guess we'll, we'll look into main memory. Uh, this is one shared resource. Let me skip to this. It's a real system, but this is an imaginary system, if you if you will. You can see that there are many shared resources, right? Pretty much everything. If you have the cores, those are shared also. So what happens in shared resources? These threads request interfere. Let me briefly talk about caches. Uh, one, one clear distinction uh, between resource sharing and partitioning happens in caches, right? Uh, you could have your L2 cache or uh, some other cache uh, either partitioned across threads or shared, partitioned across cores or shared across cores, right? If you partition it, it's called a private cache. It, the cache belongs to one core. If you share the hardware resource, the cache is shared by multiple cores. And there are clear trade-offs here. You guys remember, right? So what are the advantages of shared caches between cores? I'll go through this quickly. You get high effective capacity, right? Because any core can use any cache. And you get dynamic partitioning of available cache space. Uh, no fragmentation due to static partitioning. If you have static uh, private caches, one core may use very little of the cache, right? May need very little of the cache, but the other core cannot get to that because the cache is partitioned, it's private. Uh, another adva uh, advantage of shared cache is it's easier to maintain coherence, right? A cache block is in a single location. A shared cache block doesn't get replicated. Uh, well, that also leads to high effective capacity, right? If you have a shared cache block uh, and if you have private caches that gets replicated, that reduces your effective capacity. Uh, because instead of uh, maintaining a single copy of the cache block, in a sh as you would do in a shared cache, you're maintaining actually four copies or n copies, where n is the number of your private caches. Right? And the other advantage of a shared cache is shared data on locks do not ping pong between caches. Right? Of course, there are disadvantages to it too. Uh, one is if you have a shared cache, you get slower access. Um, and cores now incur conflict misses due to other cores accesses. That's the quality of service uh, problem. And some cores can now destroy the hit rate of other cores, right? Because there's no isolation anymore. And guaranteeing a minimum level of service to each core uh, is now harder. Because somehow you need to dynamically partition your uh, uh, cache that's shared. Okay. So how do you actually share the cache? Uh, one option is actually free-for-all sharing. Basically, you don't modify anything. You don't partition. Uh, you keep the placement and replacement policies the same as uh, what we've discussed in 447, for example. You, you can do LRU replacement or random replacement. Uh, this is obviously not thread or application aware, which means that uh, an incoming block, a Vixa block, regardless of which thread uh, that block belongs to. Which means that a, a thread that's streaming lots of data into the cache evicts, uh, uh, evicts other blocks that are potentially being useful to some other threads. Right? OK, basically, these are the problems. A cache-unfriendly application can destroy the performance of a cache-friendly application. Right? And even if uh, uh, applications, both applications may be cache-friendly, some of them may be bringing lots of data, and some of the, uh, one of them may be bringing lots of data, one of them may be bringing a small amount of data. The one that brings in lots of data uh, can evict uh, the blocks of the one that doesn't bring in that much data, right? And also, not all applications benefit equally from the same amount of cache, right? If you do LRU-based caching, you're not aware of that. And you covered one technique that takes advantage of it. If we have time, we'll get back to it and cover it in more detail. 
but that's probably next next lecture or something. So as a result, this leads to reduced performance and reduced fairness. These are some controlled cache sharing uh, papers that we, met, we might get back to when we get to it. You, you cover the utility-based cache partitioning one. Anyone remember that? No? Yes, <laughs> one person does. So the key idea, key idea over there is give more cache to the application that actually benefits the most from that cache, from a given amount of cache. Basically look at the marginal utility of a cache block for each application and allocate that cache block to the application that has the highest marginal utility for that. Of course, doing that in a block basis may not be easy. There, uh, so the paper describes how to do that uh, on a way basis. Okay, we'll get back to that, I think. Okay, any questions? I'm going relatively quickly, but hopefully these are easy concepts by now. Well, let's get to more of the meat of the lecture. Uh, we'll talk about main memory. Sharing in main memory occurs in two ways again. Bandwidth sharing, or time sharing, and capacity sharing. This is more space sharing. Right? Uh, and there are a bunch of questions that we will delve into. Capacity sharing we will not as uh, cover as much, but this is an important problem also. How much memory capacity do you allocate to uh, each thread? And where do, you, where do you actually map that memory? Because if you remember from 447 and 740, uh, memory has a specific structure, right? A five-dimensional structure. Row, bank, rank, channel. Uh, column is missing, I guess, here. <laughs> and where you, where you map uh, a page matters in terms of how much uh, interference that page gets from other applications or from even within the same application, right? You can get more bank conflicts if you allocate all of your pages into one bank. Right? Okay, and there are a bunch of metrics for optimization. This is similar to what we've looked at before. System performance, fairness, quality of service, and energy, power consumption. You guys remember the bank operation? This is just a, a brush you up on the basics. Basically, a DRAM bank is a two-dimensional structure. Data can be read from the row buffer and assume initially it's empty. Uh, when the processor or the memory controller needs to access a row, uh, uh, an address here, it supplies the row address and the column address. Assume that it's row zero, column zero. First, it needs to activate that row, which means that that row gets brought into the row buffer. And now uh, the memory controller needs to supply a column address, column zero, uh, to the DRAM chip. And the DRAM chip muxes out uh, the data in that column and sends it back to the memory controller. Right. Let's say the next access goes to row zero, column one. In this case, since the row is open already, uh, the memory controller only needs to send the column address and, the, uh, and a column command. This is called a row buffer hit because the row is already open. In this case, the data gets muxed out quickly, right? Because you don't need to activate another row. If the next access, well, if the next access is to the same row but the different column, again, this is a row buffer hit. The memory controller just needs to send the column address and the data gets out quickly. What if the next access to, is to another row? In this case, this row address doesn't match the row that's already open in the DRAM bank. So the, what the memory controller needs to do is pre-charge this row, which takes time. This is called a row buffer conflict. That pre-charge takes time, and then the memory controller needs to activate row one, which brings, up, brings down the row's contents into uh, the row buffer. And then the memory controller now can supply the column address. Right. Now this conflict access take, took much longer. Right? You need to do a pre-charge and an activate, and then a read, instead of just a read that happened with a row buffer hit. This is just a reminder of the generalized memory structure. This is the bank that I showed you, columns and rows. Again, columns and rows. And cache lines span multiple columns. Uh, but this is only uh, two dimensions. Uh, this bank, a DRAM chip, has multiple banks. And a DRAM chip is situated in a rank. 
and there are multiple ranks in a channel. This is the five dimensions, right? And then there could be multiple channels controlled by different controllers. These are independent channels. So hopefully you remember all of this from 447 and 740. If you don't, 447 has a, uh, a lot of detail on this. And the memory controller basically controls uh, what's here. Right? Basically, memory controller receives requests from different cores and potentially other parts of the system, for example, the DMA controller, uh, or maybe accelerators, right? GPU could be part of this request stream generators. And memory controller's job is to actually take those commands, uh, take those requests and satisfy them from the app. Actually, memory controller has a lot of other jobs that we have discussed in 447 and 740, but we're going to constrain ourselves a little bit with uh, scheduling today. Okay, so if these requests are from different threads, now these threads interfere, right? Because the memory controllers, pins, and memory banks are shared between these different threads, different hardware contexts. And one problem is, uh, I mean, you could, you could say you don't, want, you don't want to make it shared. You can dedicate uh, a memory controller for each thread, but that's an expensive proposition, right? Partitioning, especially at this level of the hierarchy, is very difficult because you're limited by the pin bandwidth. And pin bandwidth is not increasing as fast as the number of cores, uh, which means that the pin bandwidth per core is reducing. I guess you could allocate one, one bit per core, but now, we, now you have the overhead of controlling it, right? Uh, which means that different threads executing on different cores need to interfere with each other in the main memory system. And this problem intuitively should become worse. Uh, and we will see that uh, there are different forms of interference, and hopefully we'll cover uh, some of them one by one. Some of, some of them are obvious. You get bank conflicts, bus conflicts, and robo-free conflicts, right? This leads to reduced DRAM throughput. And threads can also destroy each other's parallelism, as we will see. Otherwise, parallel requests can become serialized. This is another way of looking at it. You can get queuing and contention delays due to band conflicts, bus conflicts, and channel conflicts. And you can also get additional delays due to DRAM constraints. Right? For example, if you have a row conflict, which wouldn't have occurred if, you, if a thread is, was running alone, you get additional overhead. Right? Because now your DRAM needs to change the row, pre-charge uh, the row which means that you have dead cycles. This is called the protocol overhead. Or you can get read to write and write to read delays that happen in DRAM. You cannot do writes and reads uh, in parallel. Make sense? And this, these could be induced more because of interference from different threads, right? One thread can be write intensive, another thread can be read, in, read intensive. And uh, this write intensive thread can be causing lots of mode switches in the memory controller. Memory controller services writes in a batch and then reads in a batch. And those mode switches incur uh, these write to read uh, delays in which the controller cannot issue any request. OK. Any questions so far? No? Everybody familiar with this? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Some of this may be very familiar to some of you. So it, will be, it may be a boring lecture. So we'll ask questions, make it interesting. OK. And the interference becomes uh, more because we're putting many cores on chip. And I think I've asked you this question before, at least in some class. When we're putting many cores on chip, uh, and uh, it's likely that we're going to keep doing this also if you want to achieve uh, large-scale parallelism, and if you want to keep the simplicity compared to a single large core. And these could be heterogeneous, of course. Uh, what we really want is n times the system performance with n times the cores. Right? And you know already that we cannot get this because of those three fundamental reasons. And what do we get today is something like this. This is probably familiar to you. This is uh, some of the experiments we had done a long time ago. And yet you run two applications on a dual core system, uh, independent applications uh, that do not synchronize with each other. 
one is MATLAB, one is GCC, and you measure the slowdown each of them experience compared to when it's run alone. MATLAB slows down by 7%, GCC slows down by more than 3x. Uh, why does this happen? Well, why does this happen? Basically, it's the main memory interference. I'll get to this. But, so you cannot fix this uh, in the operating system level, right? Assuming these are the only two applications that you're running, you can go in the operating system and uh, nice MATLAB, make it low priority, and make GCC high priority. This doesn't fix the problem because these are two applications in the system, single thread application, and the operating system schedules these two applications on the two cores. And priorities do not, get effect, uh, do not affect that scheduling. The operating system doesn't deschedule an application because it's low priority. There's a core available. Why waste it, right? And these priorities certainly don't get conveyed to the hardware resources. At least not all the way to the memory controller. But you've seen a system that conveys these priorities to the, uh, assuming you use those instructions, that conveys these priorities to some part of the pipeline, right? Anybody remember that? We discussed that earlier in the semester. There's a pop quiz for you. There was a machine that adjusted how many instructions were decoded from a thread based on its priority level. It was implemented by IBM. It's called IBM Power 5. <laughs> so it had multiple threads, right? That's simultaneous multi-threading. And uh, I don't know if you remember that picture, but you could assign priority levels from 0 to 7 to each thread, and if you assign zero to one thread, it gets, I think, zero instructions decoded, and the other thread gets eight instructions decoded every cycle. So that way you can adjust the priorities of a thread, in that machine at least. Not here. This is on a different machine, as I'll show you later. But those priorities do not get conveyed all the way to the memory controller, even in IBM Power 5 or any machine today. So we call this the memory performance hog. Basically, it hogs the performance by exploiting memory in some ways. So why does this happen? Well, we, you, you already know the answer, right? The memory interference is uncontrolled. This is the system we ran this on. The DRAM uh, memory system is the only shared resource. You have the DRAM memory controller, and you have the bus and the DRAM banks. And when you run MATLAB and GCC, this is what happens. MATLAB keeps sending a lot of requests, and memory controller keeps prioritizing MATLAB's requests. And GCC's poor little request gets delayed for a while. That's because the memory controller is unfair. Well, why is it unfair? Well, actually, before why it's unfair, uh, it turns out it's very easy to actually write this uh, program that hogs memory. And we call this the memory performance attacks or memory performance hog. But it's basically a streaming application. Right? And MATLAB turns out to be a, very similar to the streaming application. Uh, basically, we wrote this program that copies one array to another array, one large array to another large array. And every access is a cache miss. And it, uh, we ensure that every access is a cache miss, if you look at this. If you look at this application, this has very really nice sequential memory access. As a result, it has very high robo for locality because their row contains consecutive addresses. Right? And we made it very memory intensive, obviously. Right? We changed the index uh, such that every access is to the next cache line. Yes? No, we didn't touch the prefetcher. <laughs> but that shouldn't affect things in, uh, in something like this. <laughs> you just prefetch things early. Right? In fact, this is a great code for prefetcher. <laughs> it just shifts when you fetch these things. <laughs> to hopefully earlier, assuming it's behaving nicely. It should behave nicely in this. OK, so we also took the control application, which is random, which is exactly the same code, except the index is determined randomly. Basically, you copy random elements in the array. Uh, as a result, it has random memory access and very low robo for locality, but it's similarly memory intensive or we ensured it to be similarly memory intensive. 
But if you think about this for a while, these won't be similarly memory intensive if you write it exactly like this. Right? And I'll let you think about why. Can anybody guess? That's right, but that's very unlikely. We, we see that it's 3% hit rate. Actually, 3% is actually surprising. I was surprised. <laughs> but anyway, this is, this is a side. If you really want to do this experiment on a real system, uh, you should not write the ap application exactly like this, right? Because if you write it like this, this application will keep calling random in the middle of this loop, which is a very expensive function. So this will be very compute intensive. So what you really need to do is really have an, another array where you generated the indices, pre-generate the indices that you're going to access. And this will be a streaming index array. And this will be a random index array. And then you use those arrays to actually copy uh, index into the arrays that you want to copy. Then you ensure that the both applications are similarly memory intensive, right? Basically, the takeaway is if you really want to do this experiment on a real system, you need to ensure that everything in the code is the same except uh, the memory locations that are accessed or the order in which memory locations are accessed. Okay. Well, I guess I'll show you results with this later. But you can guess what happens, right? When you run these two things together, which one slows down more? Anybody? Based on what you know so far. I guess I didn't tell you exactly everything. <laughs> but you, you, know the memory, you know how the memory controllers work. The random is going to slow down more. Yes, the random is going to slow down more. Why? Because the stream one's always going to hit in the robot. Hit in the robot for, and the memory controller will take advantage of that, right? Exactly. Because of this, basically. Uh, because a row conflict memory access takes significantly longer than a row hit access, the current memory controllers take advantage of this fact. And they use a scheduling policy that prioritizes row hit memory access over every other access. Right. And the, everything else being equal, the second prioritization rule is prioritizing older access over others. So the goal of this policy is obviously to take advantage of the fact that row hits are faster and cheaper, and you get more bandwidth, more memory bandwidth if you keep ac accessing the same row. So the goal of this is to maximize DRAM throughput, right? the data throughput you get on the DRAM bus. But it's unfair when multiple threads share the DRAM system. If you have something like this, it's clear that this is going to hit in the row buffer almost a significant amount of time, and the memory controller is going to prioritize this application most of the time. Right? So that's the problem. Yeah, what does the memory hog do? I think I have already told you. Basically, if you run these two applications, this is what will happen. Uh, a stream will open a row, and it will keep hitting on it, and the memory controller will keep prioritizing it, and the random application's requests get queued in the memory request buffer, and it will wait until stream stops hitting in this row buffer, or if your memory controller has a timeout policy saying, if a request has been outstanding for more than n cycles, now I'm going to service that request, right? At that point, you'll, uh, the memory controller will service a request from the random application. And you can do the calculation. If, if that's not the case, uh, you can have, uh, with a row size of 8 kilobytes, a cache block size of 64 bytes, you can have 128 requests of stream service before a single request of random. OK? So what is the effect of this on a real system? These were uh, results with a, and an old Intel Pentium D. Those are early multi-core machines. But there were similar results with Intel Core Duo and AMD machines. Basically, this is, I think, Pentium D. Stream slows down by 18%. Uh, random slows down by almost 3x or 2.8x. Yes? Is there only one row buffer? One row buffer per bank, yes. Yes, that's a good question. So how do you ensure that these applications actually interfere with each other? Well, I guess I did lie to you again here. <laughs> if you really want to do that experiment, what you really want, uh, what you, anyway, I'm not going to go back to it. What you want is to have many outstanding misses from stream, which means that you need to unroll that loop. And that you, you do a lot of array accesses in one iteration, in both stream and random, 
and then they will hopefully collide in the memory banks. Yes. If you have a, a closed page policy, mm -hmm. it won't be the case, right? That's a that's a good question. Depends on your closed page policy. If you close after every access, uh, yes, this won't be the case because these are similarly memory intensive, and the, none of them will hit in the row buffer, right? Yeah. And because they're similarly memory intensive you'll employ the oldest first policy, and probably that'll be fair, right? Because they generate the same number of requests. For, at least for these two applications, it won't be the case. But if, uh, let's assume that you have a closed page, that's a very strict closed page policy, right? After, after every access, you close the row. Uh, modern systems, when they implement the closed page policy, they don't do it that strictly. What they do is they, mm, close the page if there is no outstanding access within the request buffer to the same, same row. And if that's the case, then the same thing will happen <laughs> because stream is keeping on generating these requests. There's a, it's very likely that there will be one request from stream to the same row in the uh, request buffer. But that's a good, that's a good question. Okay. So this happens if you run stream with other applications, you see similar kinds of slowdowns on real systems, at least at that time. At that time, there used to be something called virtual PC. This is Microsoft's virtual machine. Does it exist still? No? <laughs> Nobody knows? <laughs> I guess I had the privilege of using it. <laughs> but yes, it did slow down too. So this becomes a bigger problem with more cores. As you add more cores uh, and you do the same experiment, uh, these are simulation results actually, but uh, doesn't matter, you can do the experiment on real system also. Four applications running together. Uh, one application slows down by only 5% compared to when it's run alone. Another application slows down by almost 8x. And this turns out to be very similar to stream, lib quantum. It's streaming and lots of, uh, mm, lots of memory requests. So what are the problems caused by this? Basically now the system is vulnerable to denial of service, right? You can easily write this application and all of the other cores can slow down significantly. Uh, we're unable to enforce priorities as we discussed, right? Which means that if you're unable to enforce priorities, you cannot actually provide any service level agreement. And you also get low system performance because the cores that are waiting, that have slowed down, are really not making progress, right? Your system utilization or core utilization goes down. Basically, the end result is an uncontrollable, unpredictable system. And if you actually, I don't have that here, but if you repeat this experiment with, another, with one application, uh, let's, let's take out Hammer, for example, and replace it with some other application, you get totally different results, totally different slowdowns. So you cannot control the slowdowns. And this becomes worse uh, if you have a network on chip-based system. This is just one example. You could actually have a hotspot where, uh, I call these the attackers, but they could be a legitimate application. A legitimate application maybe accessing that hotspot, maybe a memory controller over there, right? Uh, and some other application uh, can slow down significantly because this legitimate application is hogging that resource and going through the network. And you can get uh, kind of ridiculous slowdowns actually if you uh, have this. So how do you solve the problem? Obviously there's a problem. You have an uh, inter-thread interference that's uncontrolled in the memory resources, the controller interconnect and caches. Basically we need to control it. There's no other solution that I know of other than building a system where resources are completely partitioned. So we need to design an interference aware uh, memory system. So what does that mean? Uh, what is an interference aware memory system? Uh, that means you need some hardware support to provide some fairness substrate, right? Uh, and uh, we'll talk about some solutions to this application of our memory scheduling, partitioning, and throttling. But that's not enough because the hardware has, if you have priorities, for example, hardware has no idea which application is more important to the user, assuming there is a difference in importance between applications to the user, right? Uh, so software somehow needs to be designed to configure the substrate, the hardware substrate, maybe convey priorities, for example, down into the hardware, uh, such that quality of service goals are satisfied. And we'll take a look at um, some approaches to do this, or we'll actually slowly build up to that. So there are several questions I'd like, 
I like summarizing that with three things. One is how do you reduce the inter-thread interference in the system? Uh, because this will improve system performance and core utilization, right? If you actually reduce the amount of interference. The second is how do you actually control inter-thread interference? Uh, basically provide mechanisms to enable system software to enforce some quality of service policies. And uh, of course you would like to do this while providing high system performance. Again, if you don't provide high system performance, all of these problems are easy. Right? That's, you just run that app, one application at any given time. That solves all of your uh, fairness problems. So the problem becomes interesting only if you're trying to provide high system performance, efficient utilization. And how do you make the memory system configurable, flexible? Because there, are no, there is no single goal, right? If you may have realized this already. Uh, system performance may not be the single goal because sometimes you care about only one application's performance. Sometimes you don't care about any thread's performance. You just care about some throughput, thread throughput, right? Uh, so we need to enable flexible mechanisms that can achieve many goals if you want to build a quality of service of our memory system. You need to provide fairness or throughput when needed and satisfy performance guarantees when needed. So how do you build a system like this? So there are two approaches, two general approaches uh, that I will cover. I call them the smart resources and dumb resources. Uh, this is not to say these are dumb techniques. <laughs> but smart resources, these resources that are shared, you can design each of them to have uh, some smartness, basically some control of inter-thread interference. Right. Memory controllers, interconnects, and caches. And you've seen the caches, right? We've seen the interconnects also, right? Application-aware packet scheduling, for example. It tries to control or reduce this interference. It tries to, uh, we, uh, we looked at slack-based scheduling. If, if a packet has a lot of slack, you can delay it because it's not going to significantly affect performance. Delaying it is not going to significantly affect performance. So that's, a, that's aware of the interference between different applications, even within an application in that case. The other approach is not worry about this. This is the extreme case of the dumb resource approach. Keep the shared resources as they are today. Use LRU caches, use controllers that try to maximize DRAM throughput. Uh, use interconnects that do round robin scheduling or oldest first scheduling between different packets. But somehow monitor what's going on in those resources. Perhaps you add some counters that figure out which thread is delaying which other one, how much each thread is slowed down. And based on that, control uh, injection into the system to provide some sort of fairness or to maximize performance. Basically, this, this uh, Instead of modifying each resource, you modify the periphery right, of the resource. This is one approach, like uh, source throttling. Right? You throttle the sources that are causing a lot of interference to other sources. Another way of, looking, uh, another way of doing this is by data mapping. This is, you can reduce the interference between different applications if you map their data to places uh, where they will not interfere. This is now becoming similar to partitioning. Right? You partition the data of different sources to different places. But then you don't have enough resources to par completely partition all of the interference, uh, completely partition all of the data such that you eliminate interference. Your goal in this case would be to minimize interference. Then the question is how, you do, how do you do that, right? So we'll take a look at that. Well, actually, I, I've already given you one idea, but... Um, I'll get back to this. Basically, the idea in memory channel partitioning is you have multiple channels in the system. Uh, and if you map all of the applications data to all of the channels, every application interferes with every other application. Right? In this case, of course, it's a cooked up example with two cores and two channels. So it's going to work nicely. <laughs> but hopefully, it'll give you the basic insight. Uh, Basically, you have core 0 accessing all, chan uh, all channels, core 1 accessing all channels. It happens to have only one request to this channel. If you look at this, core 1 stalls for four time units, and core 0 stalls for five time units, because that's the last time each core's request is serviced. But if you had mapped the data of these cores to different channels, 
both applications would proceed faster, at least with these requests. Right. Core 0 now stalls for four time units. Core 1 stalls for one time unit. This is a cooked up example because now you have uh, the same number of channels as the same number of applications, right? But we'll get back to this. How do you not cook it up? Or how do you make sure, uh, how, do you, how do you design a mechanism that tries to minimize interference when you have much smaller number of channels than the number of cores? Then the question is what kind of applications do you, what kind of applications data do you map to the same channel? And you can imagine mechanisms uh, right now, and this gives you some idea. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, memory scheduling in a little bit more detail. How do you design a quality of service over a memory controller? I'll go through many ideas, and I'll trial myself based on <laughs> your feedback. So if you're not going to, <laughs> if you don't ask questions, I may go very fast. And some of this, uh, many of you know. How many of you don't know? Uh, stall time fair memory scheduling, for example. Or how many of you know stall time fair memory scheduling? Only one? That's not true. Okay, there, there are people who don't know, I think, right? Do you know? That's good. <laughs> That's not a bad thing. <laughs> okay, what is, uh, if you look at the memory controller, this resolves memory contention by scheduling requests, right? Uh, the question we're going to try to answer is how do you schedule requests to provide high system performance, high fairness to applications, and configurable to system software? And later on, we're going to make it even uh, more stringent. How do you try to uh, actually uh, provide some performance bounds? So obviously, if you want to do that, memory control needs to be aware of the different threads. You cannot do it without that, as far as, uh, if you, or if you can do it, then let me know. Okay. So I think I'll uh, skip a lot of these. This is just for your uh, information. I prepare these slides that basically uh, talk about what we're going to talk about. Key idea, key takeaway. And I'd encourage you to think about all papers this way. What is the idea in this paper? What is the takeaway? Now I can tell you what stall time fair memory scheduling is, right? What is the key idea? Basically design a memory scheduler that tries to estimate those slowdowns that we looked at. How much each thread is slowed down and tries to balance those slowdowns. That's the key idea. What is the takeaway? This kind of enables pro proportional thread progress. Each thread, the goal is try to make each thread slow down equally. Right? And this does improve performance, especially when threads are heavy. And you can imagine why. OK, I'll skip these, but well, some of these are out of order, I guess. This will give you an idea of what we're going to cover. We're not going to cover all of that, so don't worry about that. So when we first started looking at the problem, this was our first idea, basically. You have this unfairness problem, different slowdowns with different threads. How do you solve the problem? Well, uh, the idea is to have a stall time fair memory scheduler. Basically, the goal of the scheduler is to uh, have threads sharing main memory experience similar slowdowns compared to when run alone. Right. That's one definition of fair scheduling. And this could also improve overall system performance by ensuring uh, threads make proportional progress. Right. Uh, and the idea is, I told you already, memory controller estimates each thread slowdown due to interference and schedules requests in a way to balance those slowdowns. Uh, I guess. I'll go over this in a little bit more detail. After covering this, I think we'll take a break. Uh, basically, uh, a D let's assume that we define fairness as a DRAM system is fair if it equalizes the slowdown of equal priority threads relative to when each thread is run alone on the same system. Uh, you can define DRAM related stall time of a thread as the time a thread spends waiting for DRAM memory because the controller has no information about other parts of the system. Uh, let's call st shared, stall time shared, as a DRAM related stall time when the thread run, runs with other threads, and stall time alone as the DRAM related stall time of the thread, how much the thread stalls when the thread runs alone. Right. And let's assume this is the memory slowdown value. You can define it as stall time shared divided by stall time alone. Right. This is a relative increase in stall time because you're sharing main memory. Somebody's interfering with you in main memory. 
And a scheduler, a stall time frame memory scheduler, aims to equalize this memory slowdown value for interfering threads without sacrificing performance. Right. That's the goal. Uh, that's why it aims to. Right. Again, the aim is to allow proportional progress, proportional uh, progress of each thread. So how do you do this? Basically, uh, well, somehow you need to track stall time shared and estimate stall time alone. How do you do that? Stall time shared, you can track it relatively easily, right? Maybe not in the memory controller, but you could do it in the core. The core, when, you, when the uh, thread is waiting for a memory request to be serviced, it can increment a counter. Stall time alone is much more difficult, right? This is the stall time of the thread when the thread is running alone. And I will not tell you exactly how it's done. I'll let you read the paper. But there's a relatively complex mechanism uh, to do this. Once you have that information, each cycle, the DRAM controller can compute the slowdown of each thread that is a legal request that can be scheduled. And it can compute an unfairness value, which is the maximum slowdown in the system, divided by the minimum slowdown in the system for, across all threads. And if unfairness is less than some system software configurable threshold, alpha, which means that unfairness is tolerable. So ideal unfairness is one, right? Every thread is uh, slowed down equally. Uh, and if, uh, if the unfairness is less than some threshold, then the uh, DRAM scheduler can use DRAM throughput oriented scheduling policy, like row hit first scheduling, as we've discussed. But if unfairness becomes intolerable, if it's greater than some value, then the controller can switch to a fairness oriented scheduling policy. In this case, what does this mean? This means that some thread has slowed down too much, right? And you know what that thread is. Well, you at least estimated what that thread is. You may not be correct, but you estimate it. Uh, and then the memory controller switches this policy where to prioritize the request from the thread that has the maximum slowdown value. And uh, this is the request uh, prioritization rules. Within that thread, you prioritize row hit first. OK. Does that make sense? Yes? The slowdown considered, is that the overall slowdown or the stall time slowdown? No, it's the st memory stall time. It's the memory slowdown. Okay. So it doesn't consider the entire system performance of the thread. Yes. And that's a shortcoming, actually. OK. So how does this prevent unfairness? Uh, but, but it keeps everything within the memory controller. Right. So how does this prevent unfairness? If you, let's just go through this uh, quickly. Uh, basically, the memory controller needs to keep track of counters uh, for slowdown for each thread. And think of this as the stream and the random application. And it also computes unfairness. And let's assume that our alpha, uh, the highest tolerable slowdown is one, uh, highest tolerable unfairness is 1.05. And let's assume that row 0 is open. T0 accesses row 0. Slowdowns don't get affected because T1 doesn't have a request. Later, T0's other request to row 0 arrives. And that gets scheduled by the memory controller, which uses row hit first scheduling policy. Once that gets scheduled, T1 slows down. Right? And the memory controller detects this and it increases T1 slowdown. And our fairness also increases, which is max divided by min slowdown. Then another request from T0 comes to the same row. The scheduler is still using the throughput-oriented scheduling policy. So it prioritizes row hit first, uh, row hit request, which increases the slowdown of T1. Now, T, now on fairness, is 1.06, which is greater than the system software configurable threshold. In this case, the memory controller switches to the fairness-oriented scheduling policy, which means that it's going to schedule the request uh, from the thread that has been slowed down the most, in this case T1. So it takes T1's request instead of the row hit request of T0. Right? Which means that uh, it needs to open another row to do a pre-charge and activate. Which means that it has slowed down T0 compared to when it's run alone, right? Because if T0 was running alone, it would be accessing that row buffer and it wouldn't get a <coughs> row buffer uh, conflict. Okay, which reduces unfairness, and then the memory controller uses the uh, uh, throughput-oriented scheduling policy again. It takes the oldest request, which happens to be this one, 
and then slowdowns change accordingly, and you get the idea, right? Basically, the memory controller keeps switching between the throughput and fairness-oriented scheduling policies based on what that unfairness value is to keep unfairness in check. And unfairness never goes significantly above this alpha value. Okay, any questions? I'm not going into more detail, but you can read the paper if you want to see how the slowdowns are estimated. What are the upsides of this? Well, that's one upside. It's good at providing fairness, uh, as the result shows. And being fair also improves performance, at least most of the time. Right. But it's not true all the time, right? Because if you're fair, as we've seen in that example, you lose robot for locality also. And if that's, that affects system performance significantly, you may lose performance. But you can improve performance by improving core utilization, system utilization, right? Because some core uh, now doesn't stall unfairly for a long time. Downsides, uh, well, as we will see, it doesn't handle all types of interference uh, because it's not trying to reduce all types of interference. And we'll see what that is. It's complex to implement. You can remove this somewhat relatively safely, I think. <laughs> Especially if you want to do this ideal slowdown estimation, it's very, very difficult uh, in a DRAM system because DRAM is very complex. Uh, there are so many timing constraints. You cannot really do this estimation very, very accurately. Well, I guess uh, there's a trade-off between how complex it becomes to implement and how good your slowdown estimations are. Uh, but even if you make the mechanism complex, your slowdown estimations can still be incorrect. Because it's hard to account for all of the types of interference that happens in the DRAM system. Well, ideally, if you would like to estimate the, inter uh, estimate the slowdown, maybe you emulate a DRAM controller that's running just for this thread, right? And you can imagine that complexity. Okay, I think I'll stop here and let's take a break for five minutes. And then we'll go over the, uh, some of the other works. This is the paper that you're assigned, actually, so. I'll give you the basic ideas. <laughs> so this is the second work we did uh, on interference reduction. And hopefully it'll become clear uh, what I meant by this doesn't consider, oh no. <laughs> there should be a shortcut in skipping these things. <laughs> this doesn't handle all types of interference, right? <laughs> hopefully that'll become clear. Uh, basically there's another problem due to interference. Uh, which is the serialization of requests that could have otherwise been served in parallel in a thread. And you're familiar with this concept very well by now. It's memory level parallelism, right? Processors try to tolerate the long latency of DRM requests by generating multiple outstanding requests. And that's called memory level parallelism. And this could be done in many ways. Out of order execution is a common way. Uh, non blocking caches enable this. Run ahead execution is one way of generating this. Prefetching is another possible way, right? Uh, and these uh, techniques, especially out of order execution and run ahead, are effective only if the DRAM controller actually services those multiple requests in parallel, right? Now the assumption is that they already go to different DRAM banks. If they go to the same DRAM bank, then they're not going to be serviced in parallel. But in a multi-core system, multiple threads share the DRAM controller. In a single core system, this may be true. In a multi-core system, multiple threads share the controller, and controller, at least with the policy that I described to you, is not aware of a thread's memory level parallelism. Right? It can service each thread's outstanding requests serially and not in parallel. Right? Let's take a look at how this happens. Let's say you're running a single thread, thread A, you have two banks in memory, and that's the only thread in the system. The thread computes, it generates two memory requests in parallel. These memory requests go to different banks, and the controller picks the first one, sends it to the first bank, and then picks the next one, sends it to the next bank, and when both of these requests are being serviced, the thread stalls. After some point, the requests are done, and they get sent back to the core, and the thread can continue, right? So what happened here is, 
the bank access latencies of the two requests are overlapped. As a result, the thread stalls for approximately one bank access latency. Right. Now what happens if you take two of these threads, two of these same thread, and replicate them, and they execute concurrently in different cores? Both of these threads compute, and at some point they each generate two DRAM requests, and these requests happen to arrive at the controller in this order, let's say. And let's say the controller takes these requests in the order they arrive. It takes thread A's request to bank zero and uh, ser services it, and then takes thread B's request to bank one and schedules it. And while these two requests are being serviced, both threads stall. Right? And then thread A's request to bank zero gets done. The controller takes thread B's request to bank zero and schedules it, and then takes thread A's request to bank one and schedules it, and both threads stall while their requests are being serviced. And after some point, both requests return back and the threads can continue computation. In this case, what happened was bank access latencies of each thread were serialized, right? As a result, each thread stalls for approximately two bank access latencies. So this is the baseline scheduler. The question is, can we do better than this? And the answer, probably most of you know that, is yes. Uh, in the previous case, the baseline scheduler was not aware of this parallelism a thread had across different banks. But you could make the scheduler aware of that. You could design a parallelism aware scheduler. In this case, I'm going to give you the same example. Both threads compute. They generate two DRAM requests each. And they arrive at the same order that I've shown you before. And the controller, let's say, takes thread A's request to bank zero and schedules it first. And then, because it's parallelism aware, the next request it takes is not thread B's request to bank one but it checks whether thread A has a request to bank one because it already scheduled thread A's request to bank zero. And it turns out thread A has a request to bank one, so the controller prioritizes thread A's request to bank one and schedules it. In this case, thread A's requests are serviced in parallel. Thread B waits, none of its requests are being serviced, and both threads stall. After a while, thread A's request to bank zero gets completed, and thread B's request to bank zero gets scheduled. And thread A's request to bank one gets completed, returned to the core. And the controller takes thread B's request to bank one and schedules it. But now while these two requests are being serviced, thread A can make progress, right? Because both of its requests are returned. Thread B stalls. And after some point, thread B's requests get completed and thread B can continue also. So what happened in this case, you've saved some cycles because thread A A's progress was enabled because its requests were serviced in parallel. Right? Its requests were not serialized. And if you compute the average stall time across the threads, you, you get approximately 1.5 bank access latencies. So that's the idea. How do you design this par uh, a parallelism where a scheduler can get you better throughput? Because it preserves the parallelism of each thread. Then the question is how do you design the scheduler? Right? Well, there are two principles. Uh, one is parallelism awareness, and I've already kind of hinted at this, right? If you schedule requests from a thread to different banks back to back, you preserve that thread's parallelism. Right? But if you keep doing this greedily, this can cause starvation, right? You could be scheduling requests back to back to different banks from the same thread, and the thread can be making progress. As a result, threads could be, could be generating more requests. And soon, you could be scheduling only this thread's requests in the, main, in the memory system. So we'd like to prevent this. And the idea is to use request batching uh, to prevent uh, this, right? Basically, the controller groups a fixed number of all these requests from each thread into a batch and services the batch before all other requests. Uh, and it forms a new batch when the current one is done. And this is not a new idea at all, right? Do you guys know where else this idea was used? No? In disks. People actually developed the idea of batching in disks in the 1960s. And that was the, uh, the idea was to ensure uh, starvation doesn't happen. You have long latencies and um, disks have good set streaming uh, access uh, latency, but terrible random access latency. And you could be optimizing for streaming performance 
but the, that then your random access latency could suffer, especially in a multi-programmed environment. So people grouped requests into batches, this request into batches, and ensure that that batch gets serviced first, regardless of whether or not the requests are streaming or random access. And after that, they move to the next batch. Right. And we referenced that paper, actually. It's a good paper. You can read it. It's by Frank in 1967. Mm. It's referenced in this. I don't remember the reference number. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's the basic idea. Uh, the batch, the oldest batch is prioritized over others, and you form a new batch when the oldest batch is done, totally serviced. So, uh, so this eliminates starvation and provides fairness. And it also allows parallelism awareness within a batch. Now you can do anything within a batch without causing starvation, right? You could have any kind of scheduling policy. So just to pictorialize this, yeah, let's say we have two banks and we have these four different threads and each has one request to each bank. Uh, the controller basically looks at its queue and groups a fixed number of requests to each bank into a batch and, it's, uh, and then it uh, first takes thread zero's requests and serves them in parallel. In the meantime, other requests arrive, but they do not get put into this batch. Because if you put them into the batch now, you're eliminating the starvation guarantee, uh, guarantees, right? Starvation freedom guarantees. Then the controller takes thread one's requests and serves them in parallel. Then the controller takes thread two's requests and serves them in parallel. And the controller takes thread three's requests and serves them in parallel. And once the last request is done, the controller forms a new batch with the requests that are in skew. So you don't delay the request to form the batch, but you form the batch based on what request you have in the queue. Okay, so that's the idea. So there are two components, obviously. One is request batching, and the other is within batch scheduling. So how do you do each of that? Batching is relatively easy, right? You can have uh, a single bit associated with each request. That's the mark bit. And if this bit is set, then that means the thread is in the oldest batch. How does the controller form the batch? It marks up to some marking cap oldest request per bank for each thread. And this, these marked requests constitute the batch. And the controller forms a new batch when no marked requests are left. Uh, and the key idea of batching is to prioritize marked requests over unmarked ones, which means that there is no re reordering requests across batches, uh, no starvation and high fairness. Then the question is, how do you prioritize the request within a batch? Right. Well, you can actually use any existing DRAM scheduling policy within a batch, right? Row hit first uh, could be the policy you may want to use. And then you get some non-starvation uh, or starvation freedom guarantees if you do that. But we want to be uh, better. We want to be parallelism aware, right? We want to preserve each thread's, intra, uh, each, each thread's bank parallelism. So we'd like to service each thread's request back to back. But how do you do that? Well, you can compute a ranking of threads. The scheduler can compute a ranking of threads when the batch is formed. And higher rank threads are prioritized over lower ranked ones. This improves the likelihood that requests from a thread are serviced in parallel across different banks. Right? Because you rank the threads, and different banks obey the same ranking, which means that different threads are prioritized in the same order across different banks. But then the question is, how do you actually form that ranking? It turns out this ranking scheme affects both system performance and fairness. Uh, and there are two goals we want to have normally, right? We want to maximize system throughput, and we want to minimize unfairness. And let's assume we define unfairness as equalizing the slowdown of the threads. Uh, we're going to modify this later a little bit. It turns out these goals lead to the same policy, or at least uh, in an approximate way. If you want to maximize system throughput, you want to minimize the average stall time of the threads within the batch, right? If you minimize the stall time, hopefully the system is not stalling as much. And if you want to minimize unfairness, uh, you would like to service threads with inherently low stall time early in the batch. Why? Uh, because let's say you, you have a thread that has low stall time, which means that it's not memory intensive in terms of the stall time. Uh, and if you inflict the same amount of delay to it compared to a thread that has a very high stall time. If you think about the slowdowns, the 
thread that has inherently low stall time will slow down much more, right? Because your, the relative increase in stall time is much higher for that thread. Which means that if you want to do both of these, you would like to do a shortest stall time first ranking of the threads. Because if you do that, that minimizes the average stall time. That also prioritizes the threads that have low stall time, right? Assuming you estimated these stall times correctly. Yeah. So it's a shortest job first ranking. So this is not a new idea also, right? People have looked at shortest job first for, for a long time. This is, this is the earliest paper, actually, as far as I know. Unless you, you find another paper and tell me. Mm. Assuming you've done the estimation correctly, this provides optimal system throughput. Well, this system is a little bit different, but <laughs> we'll get back to that. Uh, basically, the idea is to have controller estimate each thread's stall time within the batch and rank the threads with shorter stall time higher, which will hopefully satisfy these objectives. So how do you do this? How do you actually implement this? Uh, so we're going to approximate that stall time. Uh, we're going to uh, have the controller collect two uh, counters for each thread. One is the maximum number of mark requests from that thread to any bank. And the second is the total number of mark requests called total load for that thread. The first one is called the max bank load. Uh, max bank load gives an idea of how long your stall time is. Right? Because if you have many requests queued up in the same bank, uh, your inherent stall time is high. If you have only at most one request to any bank, your inherent stall time is low. So we're going to rank the threads with lower max bank load higher because the uh, estimate is that that has a low stall time. And you can argue that this is not correct and you'll be right. <laughs> but it works. <laughs> uh, it's, it's easier to do. Um, and uh, total number of mark requests will be used as a tiebreaker. If, if this value is equal across uh, two different threads, we're going to rank the thread with total, lower total load higher. So let's take a look at how we compute this. This is, uh, we're going to assume rows uh, do not exist, but the paper itself is an example with row, uh, row hit and row conflict requests. Let's, let's compute the max bank load and total load for each thread. Let's look at thread zero. Max bank load of thread zero is one because the maximum number of requests it has to any bank is one. Right? And its total load is three because it has three requests. Thread one. Its max bank load is 2 because the maximum number of requests it has to any bank is 2 to bank 0. And its total load is 4. Thread 2, its max bank load is 2 because it has maximum 2 requests to any bank. And its total load is 6. And thread 3, its max bank load is 5. And its total load is 9. So we rank these threads. Thread 0 is ranked higher because it has the lowest max bank load. And the prediction is that it has the shortest stall time when running alone. Uh, thread 1's max bank load is 2. It's ranked higher than thread 2, which has the same max bank load because total load is the tiebreaker. And thread 3's max bank load is 5, so it's ranked the lowest. So now we have a ranking of threads, right? And assume that these are the requests within a batch. Now, how does the scheduler behave? Like, what, what would be the performance improvement if you do this kind of ranking? This is the baseline scheduling order. I'm going to assume that it's the arrival order. So it's a first come, first serve scheduler. And this is a time unit in which each request is serviced. Uh, and there is a lot of simplification here, but uh, the basic idea is there. If you look at the stall times, the stall time of thread 0 in this case is uh, 4, because its last request is serviced after the fourth time unit. Stall time of thread 1 is also 4. Again, because its last request is service after four time units. Thread 2 stall time is 5, and thread 3 stall time is 7. So average uh, stall time is five bank access latencies, or five time units. Now let's take a look at the scheduling order for the parallelism over batch scheduling. We've already computed the ranking, right? Thread 0's requests are prioritized over thread 1's, over thread 2's, over thread 3's. Which means that we're going to prioritize thread 0's requests which means that its request will be serviced in parallel in the first time unit. So its stall time will be 1. Then thread 1's request will be prioritized, which means that its last request will be serviced after two time units. Right. 
Remember, each bank obeys this rank order. So each bank prioritizes uh, according to that rank order. So thread one stall time is two. Thread two's stall time is four. Its last request gets serviced after four cycles or four time units. And thread three's stall time is seven. And you can look at the schedule. The schedule is much more regular, right? It tries to preserve that parallelism. And the average uh, uh, stall time is 3.5 bank access latencies in this case. So you get a 30% uh, stall time, average stall time improvement within this batch. Okay. So what is the scheduling policy to uh, accomplish this? This is the prioritization order. Uh, mark requests are prioritized over others. This is the batching. Right? And Within a batch, you do parallelism aware within batch scheduling, and this is the prioritization order. Row hit requests are prioritized over others, and the higher ranked threads requests are prioritized over others, and then older requests are prioritized over others. And you could actually argue, why not do three before two? And you could be right. There's a trade-off between locality and parallelism there, uh, which is actually a tough trade-off. The first one preserves row locality, as much as possible, at least at the batch boundaries, right? What happens is if you do this one at the batch boundary, you schedule the thread uh, that has kept the row open in the previous batch, which loses some parallelism because there may be different rows that are open, right? But it turns out preserving this performs slightly better than uh, doing, the, uh, doing three first over two, at least empirically. Well, that's a tough trade-off. That, that trade-off always exists in systems, locality versus parallelism. If you want to optimize locality, you usually lose parallelism. If you want to optimize for parallelism, you usually lose locality. <laughs> you try to balance uh, both of them. Okay, so there are three properties here. It does exploit robo for locality and inter-thread bank parallelism. It's work conserving, which means if there is an unmarked request, uh, to a bank without any mark request, you don't uh, stop servicing that. You service that, right? And this marking cap is important, and you can read the paper for that. Marking cap determines how big your batches are, how many requests from a thread are there in each batch, right? And if you're too small of a cap, you're not exploiting robo for locality well, because you have too few requests from each thread. If you have too large of a cap, now your memory non-intensive threads uh, get uh, penalized because your batches are large, right? And a memory non-intensive thread waits for the next batch to finish. Okay, there are many more trade-offs you'll read about. So what is the hardware of cost of all this? Uh, well, that's it. There are no complex operations like stall time fair memory scheduling. There's no need for slowdown estimation. And you already know this. Uh, scheduler makes a decision only every DRAM cycle, right? Scheduler is not on the critical path. Some results, if you look at unfairness, this is the max memory slowdown divided by minimum memory slowdown. Uh, and these are results with different kinds of schedulers, row hit first scheduler and average across a large number of workloads. Uh, first come first serve oldest first scheduler. This is a network fair queuing scheduler which you can read about. It uses fair queuing principles uh, to schedule a bit, uh, different threads to basically uh, allocate equal bandwidth to different threads. And this is stall time fair memory scheduler and parallelism or a batch scheduler. And you can see that uh, stall time fair memory scheduler is uh, better than the other schedulers. And first come first serve is more fair than first ready first come first serve, row hit first scheduler. But it's not fair enough because it doesn't take into account different intensities, so it prioritizes older threads. Uh, it prioritizes requests with uh, many requests, right? Because that happens to be older. Those requests happen to be happen to look older to the scheduler. And parallelism or batch scheduling provides better fairness uh, than stall time fair memory scheduling. One of the main reasons is stall time fair memory scheduling is not able to estimate these slowdowns correctly. And system performance, again, you can read about this, but uh, this performs better than uh, the previous schedulers. And system performance benefits come from two things. One is the fairness improvement, and the second is actually the parallelism preservation, right? You basically reduce the average stall time. 
which you, not, you do not do with the stall time fair memory scheduler. Okay, so what are some takeaways? Upsides, basically, there is this new type of interference that actually happens in uh, multi-core systems, which is you serialize requests. And that's the uh, main upside of this scheduler. And it's a simpler mechanism compared to uh, stall time fair memory scheduling. Right. Downsides, well, as, as we will take a look, well, you may not take a look, but what, what happens if you have multiple memory controllers, right? How do you coordinate uh, their behavior now? How do you ensure that they all get ranked? Uh, the threads get ranked consistently across all the controllers. Now you can think about that a little bit. And one other, perhaps more important downside is this doesn't always prioritize the latent sensitive applications, right? Latent sensitive application uh, gets delayed before, uh, mm, let's assume that you define latent sensitivity as not intensive application without any information from the application. Uh, even a non-intensive application gets delayed until the previous batch is serviced, right? Okay. Make sense? Any questions? No? <laughs> okay, I guess I'll go quickly and finish this also and then let you go after that. <laughs> so we'll look at another scheduling mechanism. This is uh, another way of thinking about this, I think, which is to maximize system performance. This is Jungu's work. Uh, basically, if you think about it in a different way, uh, a thread, when it executes, alternate between two states or episodes. One is a compute episode where there are no outstanding, it's not waiting for any outstanding miss. And the other is a memory episode. It has some outstanding memory requests it's waiting for. And memory episodes are episodes uh, with low uh, progress or slow progress for that thread. It's low IPC, right? It's waiting for misses most of the time. And these episodes are uh, episodes where the thread is making fast progress. If you look at the, uh, look at the memory scheduling problem from the memory scheduler's perspective. To maximize performance, you would like to minimize the time spent in memory episodes. Right. Now, if you look at it from the system per perspective, you really would like to maximize the time spent in compute episodes. And I'd like you to think about the <laughs> difference between those things. I think thinking about a way of maximizing compute episodes is better than thinking about minimizing memory episodes. But Assume that this is what we want to do right now. So if you want to do this, if your goal is to minimize the memory episodes, time spent in memory episodes, you would really like to prioritize the thread whose memory episode will end the soonest. Right? Uh, this minimizes the time spent in memory episodes across all threads. And this is, uh, if you know about queuing theory, this is analogous to shortest remaining processing time scheduling. Right? If you have a single server queue, doing this gives you the optimal performance or optimal throughput, assuming, uh, yeah. So uh, assuming you know, the, of course, the remaining processing time, right? Assuming you know the job sizes a priori. But in this case, in the memory scheduling, you don't know the job sizes, or you don't know the size of these episodes. When I say job, think about the memory episode. You don't know the memory episodes because you don't know what requests the threads will generate. You know when the episode begins, because the thread has zero requests, and when the episode begins when the thread has one request, but you don't know when it'll end, right? So it's hard to do. So it, it turns out uh, this past is an excellent predictor for future. Uh, if you think about the attained service of a thread within an episode as its past, this attained service is a good predictor for this remaining service which means that a large attained service leads to a large expected remaining service. Why? Well, it'll be a statistical argument here. <laughs> you can think about why the programs have this behavior perhaps, but it turns out these memory episode lengths are actually Pareto distributed. Now what does this mean? If you plot the memory episode lengths uh, for a benchmark and the probability that the memory episode length is greater than the length that's specified in the x-axis uh, in log-log scale, you get a linear, if you get a linear curve, this is a Pareto distribution. And Pareto distribution tells that the longer an episode has lasted, the longer it will last further. 
It's a, di it's a distribution with a decreasing hazard rate. And I'll let you read the paper for more detail. Uh, but this means that attained service so far correlates with the remaining service, which means that fairing least attained service memory episode is the same as fairing the memory episode which will end the soonest. So that's the idea. It's based on this uh, discovery that the memory episodes are distributed uh, uh, in a Pareto, Pareto way. So this is, I guess, from uh, people have found this distribution in many different uh, systems phenomena. Like uh, uh, the longer you transfer a file through an FTP protocol, the longer you'll transfer it, which means that the file sizes are Pareto distributed, transferred over FTP, because you have a very heavy tail. <laughs> or in real life, the longer you sleep, the longer you will sleep, perhaps. That happens to me, but <laughs> that's a joke, of course. <laughs> You don't need to take that seriously. <laughs> but that, is, that happens to be true for, true for me. <laughs> OK. So the approach is basically we would like to prioritize a memory episode with least remaining service. And this is the least attained service memory scheduling. This actually was employed in uh, operating system schedulers. There's a least attained service operating system scheduler. An operating system, uh, uh, and the reason is over there you have a similar distribution. The length of the jobs in terms of the time they will take is similarly uh, Pareto-like distributed. So we'd like to prioritize the episode with the least remaining service. Uh, and remaining service correlates with attained service because of this, uh, um, we, we found because of that discovery, as I told you, which means that you can track attained service and you can track that relatively easily, right? It's basically, uh, it can be tracked by a per thread counter. How many cycles uh, have you serviced? Er, during how many cycles since the beginning of the episode have you actually serviced this request? Uh, have you actually serviced a request from this thread? And once you have those counts, you can prioritize the memory episode with the least attained service. Right? This minimizes the memory episode time. Does that make sense? But this doesn't consider long-term thread behavior. Uh, so if you look at, uh, and hopefully what I said earlier will become clear at this point, if you look at thread 1's memory episode and thread 2's memory episode in isolation, what I've already told you says you would like to prioritize thread 1 because it's a shorter memory episode. Right? But this is very short-term thread behavior. If you look at long-term, this thread 1 might be doing this, right? which means that it has a short memory episode followed by an even shorter compute episode, and then it goes back to the short memory episode. But thread two is doing this. It has a long memory episode, but it's followed by a much, much longer compute episode. Right. In this case, the right thing to do is actually to prioritize thread two. Uh, it's more beneficial because it results in very long stretches of compute episodes. Right. Now this is where uh, what I said earlier, and maybe you can design a better memory scheduler that way, uh, comes into play. If you want to optimize system performance, you really would like to maximize the compute episodes, right? But the memory controller is not aware of the compute episodes. It's aware of the memory episodes. That's why we were minimizing memory episodes. And if you maximize the compute episode, this is what you would do. I don't know if that made sense, but you can think about it, yes. Say it again. The difference between two memory episodes is the length of the computer episode. The length of the computer episode. That's right, yes. Yeah, maybe you can predict that, potentially. I don't know. But maybe you can look at that. <laughs> that could be interesting. <laughs> now you have a, you have a task. <laughs> So how do you take into account, assuming that you don't do that or you don't try to uh, figure out the compute episodes, all you know is how long the memory episodes are, which is what you know at the memory controller. Uh, basically, instead of considering memory episodes in isolation, you look at a quantum, long time quantum, and count the attained service during that time quantum. Basically, increment the attained service counter across that time quantum instead of incrementing it within the memory episode. 
That's the idea. And during a quantum, each thread attains services tracked by the memory controller. At the end of a quantum, the memory controller basically, uh, so this is the final uh, thread ranking mechanism, the memory controller computes the thread's total attained service as uh, the total attained service weighted by some value plus the attained service weighted by mi one minus that value uh, and adds that to uh, the total attained service counter. And if you have this value alpha high, that means you have more bias towards history. You basically uh, add, um, uh, if, if your alpha is uh, one, for example, you don't take into account the previous memory episode, right? Or a pre previous quantum. So this way you can take into account even longer term thread behavior beyond the quantum because threads have stable behavior for a long time. And the threads are ranked favoring threads that have lower total attained service value. So you can read this uh, more in the paper. I did not assign this paper, but I'd encourage you to read it. Uh, and in the next quantum, threads are serviced according to their ranking. So this takes into account uh, long, uh, thread behavior longer than a quantum, right? If your alpha, uh, unless your alpha is uh, zero, right? If your alpha is zero, you just look at the previous quantum. If your alpha is different, you basically have an exponential weighting moving average across the quantums, where the recent quantums weighted more heavily uh, than uh, past quantums in terms of attained service. Okay. So there's a reason why it's called Atlas. It's adapter per thread least attained service scheduler. Here's a request prioritization order. Uh, first is to prevent starvation, a, a request that has gone over a threshold is prioritized. Uh, and this is a good thing to have any, in any scheduler. Um, the second is to maximize performance. The threads that have higher least attained service ranking, as I showed you, uh, are prioritized over others. And third, row hit requests are prioritized over others and the tiebreaker oldest request. I'll not cover this, but you can read the paper uh, about the coordination aspects of it. How do you coordinate between different controllers? So what's the effect of this? Uh, this is performance with different schedulers. And this performs better than uh, all of these different schedulers in terms of system throughput. And you can read the paper. And it performs better uh, as you become more bandwidth limited. So this is a system with 24 cores and one memory controller. That's a very bandwidth start system, as you can see from the system throughput numbers, weighted speed up numbers, right? The ideal weighted speed up you can get in the system is 24, ideal possible. But the weighted speed up you get here is about four with a first come, first serve scheduler. So you're really starved. Uh, there, there are large slowdowns. Well, and this is a system that's very expensive, 24, controllers and, uh, 24 cores and 16 controllers. There, of course, schedulers are very similar to each other, right? Because if you have enough bandwidth, scheduling becomes a non-issue, or memory scheduling becomes a non-issue. I guess even in that case, Atlas performs a little bit better by prioritizing the threads that are uh, in this attained service order. And this is the variation with the number of cores. As the number of cores increases, the performance increases if, if you fix the memory controllers. Okay, and you can uh, think about why that is. Okay, uh, let's see. I already covered some of this, I think. But you can make any of these memory schedulers configurable by system software. Uh, and all of the uh, schedulers that I described have some way of prioritizing threads that are more important than the others. For example, the stall time fair memory scheduler, you can actually uh, multiply the stall time you get with the importance of a thread. If a thread is really important, you can multiply the stall time it gets with that importance level that appears to have very high stall time, appears to have high slowdown, and the scheduler will automatically uh, prioritize that. In this case, you can scale the attained weight with the thread weight, right? how important the thread is, and make sure that the attained service uh, number is low for those threads that have high weight. Right? That way, those threads get prioritized. And it turns out this is low complexity, and you can read the paper for the hardware cost. OK, so I think I'm right on time. But upsides of this, this is good at improving performance. It's better than any of the previous ones. And it's even lower complexity than PARBS. 
And uh, because uh, the scheduling or ranking is done uh, in large intervals, large quanta, coordination among controllers happens infrequently. You can read the paper for this, but if you think about par BS, the ranking is done when you figure, uh, finish a batch. Right? And those batches are done in thousands of cycles. Depends on your batch size, but there's a big trade-off. If you increase your batch size, now you have uh, a fairness problem. Uh, so this is more tolerant to uh, coordination mistakes, if you will. Uh, the downside is lowest rank threads or medium rank threads get delayed significantly. So you get high on fairness with this because think you, you're actually forming a ranking of all the threads in the system and the last rank thread gets delayed a lot. Actually, it turns out the middle rank threads get delayed even more because those are less tolerant to delays also, right? Because the uh, probably lowest rank threads have lots of stall time to begin with, but medium rank threads have not a whole lot of stall time. So if you delay them a lot, uh, you get high unfairness. Okay, I'll stop here but we'll continue on Monday.